Um, what were we talking about last time? Hypocortisolism and hy hypercortisolism. I think that's what we were talking about. Okay, so hypercortisolism uh, can cause anorexia nervosa. Uh, it can make uh, <laughs> kids shy, can, uh, elementary kids shy. What else can it do? It can make you die sooner of Alzheimer's disease. Hypocortisolism uh, leads to all kinds of interesting problems. It's like the person's not nearly as sensitive or they're overly sensitive to things. Uh, fibromyalgia, of course, they uh, develop the immune, uh, autoimmune diseases of rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, asthma. Uh, as health psychologists, uh, we have two basic ways of, of measuring things. One of them is uh, self-report inventories that we give to individuals, self-report inventories like uh, last time I think I talked about, or I keep getting this class mixed up with the next class. Uh, but uh, self-report in inventories like Beck's depression inventory, uh, we'll ask them about what happened in their lives, you know, and they have to write all this stuff down. A lot of times they skip it. Uh, a lot of times they will lie, and that's a problem, because we need them to tell us the truth. Uh, there's also a daily hassle scale, and if they want to seem really hassled, uh, then they will, uh, they'll, they will uh, <laughs> write down things that, uh, that uh, aren't quite true, or maybe they will leave things out, and that's a problem as well. Uh, the other and the other type of measurement that we do is a physiological measurement, and we're going to be talking about some of those in just a minute. And of course, uh, the problem with self-report surveys is a lot of times they uh, don't remember things, they forget, and uh, of course, for that reason, uh, they're leaving the best parts out. Uh, what was I watching? Oh, oh, has anybody seen the movie Clerks? Mm -hmm. My God. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as raw as you can get. Yeah. My goodness gracious. <laughs> so she's she asks him how many how many women he's had sex with. That's the only part I watched. As soon as that, as soon as they got into that conversation, I kind of turned it off. But uh, she asked him how many times she said how many women he's had sex with. And she, he says twelve. And then he asked her. And she says three. And then of course they got a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she says three, uh, but of course she wasn't counting. Uh, she was only counting uh, gen uh, 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 vaginal uh, intercourse, I'm guessing, because then she went into more explicit, or he did, somebody did, I don't remember. Yes, I do, I remember exactly what happened. It was just a couple of nights ago, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay, uh, really interesting movie. I've never seen the whole thing. They have a second one too. Oh, I saw the second one, and the second one was kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, it was less, it, it was more commercial, I would say. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that one, like quadruple X rated or something. <laughs> Everything is about intercourse of one ilk or another. Very interesting. <clears throat> okay, health psychologists have solved the, the self-report. Uh, so the, the whole point is, of course, if you've seen the movie Clerks, uh, is the fact that she forgets about all these other guys that she's had a form of sexual intercourse with. Right? She's only talking about genital, genital sex. Uh, and she doesn't even think about these other guys. And then somehow they get into that part, portion of the conversation. And I, I, you would have assumed that he would be really upset, but uh, he seemed to not even care that much. We always get into arguments about one thing or another. It's really kind of a strange thing to say. Anyway. That's the problem with self-reports. Uh, sometimes you don't, uh, you can't remember things. Uh, health psychologists have solved the self-reported inaccuracy issue by sampling people's behavior and experiences in real time in a process known as ecological uh, momentary assessment. Uh, you can use diaries uh, where they write everything down. Uh, and and I, I don't really understand cell phones. I do have one, I brought it today. I usually forget it, but I brought it today thinking my wife would want to call me after she got her flowers. She didn't. <laughs> I know, she didn't call me. Why wouldn't she call me? Uh, I don't know, my heart's broken, I think. 
Anyway, signal contingent uh, recording on a smartphone or, or a notepad uh, where it, uh, it beeps every once in a while and you have to write down uh, whatever's going on. Of course, I don't understand any of this stuff. I don't know how you can type on a telephone like that. But I guess you can. I guess people text and things. I don't understand this stuff. I can't even get my text messages. Last time I was, uh, I was home, my daughter was supposed to teach me how to, to get my text messages. But, you know, she just, like, it's the same way they teach you everything. They, they, they go to a certain place, and then they say, okay, you just do this, this, and this. And, and of course, they're po pointing to things. Of course, they do it all the time. So it doesn't mean anything. But I can't even get to the first screen. You know, I can barely turn my phone on. I know how to turn my phone on. And if it rings, I can answer it. Okay? That's all that's important, right, Joe? There we go. Okay. As long as Joe's okay with it, I guess I'm okay as well. Anyway, I don't know how this stuff works. Maybe someday I'll figure it out. Physiological measures include changes in heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, electrical conductance of the skin. And we can look at all these, these different things. That's what uh, Fitbit is all about. It gives you your blood, that doesn't give you your blood pressure, but it gives you, gives you your respiration rate. How am I doing right now? Wait a minute. 109, you gotta be kidding me. That's my heart rate right now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 109. All right. All right. Anyway, uh, like your uh, doctor, it gives you your heart rate, which is always kind of interesting. Mine's usually not when I'm not lecturing, of course, uh, is is in the 50 range. So that's not that's not too bad. If I'm just sitting down, almost going to sleep, like I did, I, that's, I had to drink a Mountain Dew before I came up here because I was afraid I'd, I'd fall asleep during while I was trying to talk to you guys. Uh, biochemical measures, uh, we can measure your cortisol, your epinephrine level, or your norepinephrine level, and these give us a lot of really interesting uh, information. Uh, stress, uh, we know that stress uh, causes problems. Now we know that stress causes problems. Uh, if we were dealing with medicine, which I was 30 years ago, uh, most medical professionals didn't believe it. Uh, if the psychologist or somebody tried to tell them that stress is causing problems, they wouldn't believe it, and they just pretended that, that it wasn't happening at all. The dumb shits. Oh, I'm sorry, I put that on the film, didn't I? <laughs> they were stupid. I mean, they did. La, 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 I mean, they did the whole thing. It was really kind of kind of dumb. Uh, this guy got into trouble. He was a medical doctor, and he said, "Yeah, this is true." Uh, he was a doctor from Harvard, uh, Herbert Benson. He got in just a ton of trouble with uh, with his uh, with the AMA because he said that there was a connection between uh, people's emotions and uh, stress and, uh, and diseases. <clears throat> but nobody believed it until, until they started doing research in that area. In the 1980s, Robert Ader uh, was testing rats to see if he could create a taste aversion to make them stay away from sweet drinks. He, was, he wasn't working with stress. He didn't think he was working with stress. As it turned out, he was working with stress because when he took their, their sugar water away, it changed their, it, it increased their stress, and it changed their immune system. And this is the first time anybody saw or, or did research showing that the immune system was, uh, was affected by stress. These rats were so uh, stressed out that, they, it, it, that it killed them. They died, these guys died. These, all these rats died. As much fun as that is, I don't like rats. So dead rats are not the most unpleasant thing I can think of. Live rats are the most unpleasant thing I can think of. So the dead rats don't bother me at all. Uh, though there were no toxins present, Ader's uh, rats showed suppression of their T cells. We know that the T cells, of course, are the uh, cells that identify the antigens. And they are, they're the ones that attach the antibodies to the antigens. Okay, so that's the job of the T cell. So if, if, you have a, a, if you have suppressed T cells, that means that you can't fight off diseases as readily because you don't have the T cells to attach the antibody to the antigen. So they're more likely to die of, a, uh, of, of some disease. The decrease in T cells made the rats more susceptible to disease because of their depleted reserves. The rats died from the stress literally died from the stress. Ader's findings were replicated in the study by Nicholas Cohen, uh, stress killed the rats. And this is Ader and this is Cohen right here. 
Uh, and these guys actually prove that uh, you can kill a rat just by stressing it out. The question is, how do you stress them out? In this case, of course, they had them in a cage and they didn't feed them their sugar water. And they were upset. <clears throat> in uh, 2003, Candace Pert uh, demonstrated that, that the brain monitored the immune system with receptor cells in the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus is the master gland. It's the gland that uh, tells uh, that uh, tells the body how to do how to uh, how much metabolism that you need. Uh, it uh, regulates your stress. Uh, so the hypothalamus is extremely important. And, and she showed that there were immune system uh, receptor cells in the hypothalamus. Pert was able to prove that T cells produce cytokines uh, that had receptors in the brain that allowed the brain to monitor the immune responses. So the hypothalamus knows exactly what's going on. Psychoneuroimmunology is a subfield of, of health psychology that emphasizes the interaction of psychology uh, of the psychological, the neuroendocrine, and the immunological uh, processes in the stress and illness. I took a class when I was working on my PhD, I took a class in psychoneuroimmunology. It was fascinating. Uh, of course, I'd already worked in medicine for a number of years, so all of this stuff made sense. Uh, the individuals taking this class that had, didn't have any medical background, they were completely lost throughout most of the, uh, most of the class. But of course, since I had already worked in this for 30 years and had been dealing with all of these things, all of this stuff made a lot of sense to me. Uh, the concept was coined in 1964, but until Ader, Cohen, and Perth's experiments, it could not be proven and was discarded as mere theory by medical doctors. Doctors don't want to change anything. Uh, they don't want to change anything because, no, and nobody does, actually change is, is, uh, seems to be a very dangerous thing for almost everybody, as fascinating as that seems. So people don't like to change, especially doctors. PhDs don't like to change. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, uh, as a psychologist, as a teaching psychologist, I'll use the same textbook over and over and over and over again. Uh, it's because I don't want new information. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's because I've already worked up my, my lectures and I don't want to change my lectures. But if it's something has changed, we've got to, ch we've got to change it, don't we? Or do we? I had a colleague that uh, refused to change uh, what he called uh, intellectual disability, uh, what we call intellectual disability. He called it mental retardation, and by God, they had to fire the guy to, to, uh, to get him to change, and he never did change anyway, so I don't know. Kind of strange. People don't like to change. Medical doctors don't want new information. They want to just... Go, by the, go with the flow, go with uh, what everybody's been doing uh, for a hundred years. Uh, they, they want their, the knowledge that they, that they learned in medical school to, to be absolute. But the reality is that in psychology, especially in psychology, there is no information that's absolute. Things are going to change in the future. If society changes, then, psycho then, then our psychology will change. Uh, I talk about this in abnormal psychology all the time. The reality is that what is, what is the rule now will not be the rule in the future. The DSM-3 is tons different from the DSM-4. And the DSM-5 is different than the DSM-4. And this is going to continue to change, especially with the Internet. Remember, the Internet didn't start until 1993. So those of you, Joe, who are, who are addicted to uh, uh, video games, Joe, okay, there we go. <laughs> You're going to be different. Because you, you do that kind of stuff all the time. And that's going to change things. It's going to change the way that you look at things. Uh, those of us who can't even work our cell phones, uh, we're, our, our, our mental capacity is going to be totally different than yours is. Because you're going to understand the internet. You're going to be uh, thinking that, uh, that knowledge is based on Google. Well, how, how does Google get all this information? Well, mostly it's from Wikipedia, evidently. And so that's where all your knowledge comes from. But I mean, everything's going to change. It really will. I was reading an article from New York Times. I keep talking about this, but they're talking about pornography and, and elementary school kids. They're not talking about high school kids. They're not talking about teenagers. They're not talking about young adults. They're talking about elementary school kids. And they were talking to this one kid that said... Uh, he found pornography when he was eight. And uh, the, the question is, how, 
if, if, if you view pornography when you're a child, what does that, and, and you're a male, what does that do as far as your concept of, of what, how females are supposed to act and react to, uh, to anything that has to do with sex? It's really a fascinating article. And it made me think, my God, we're not even, <laughs> we, we, don't, we have people that don't even acknowledge that the internet may change things. I mean, psychologists, there, there are a lot of psychologists out there, don't even, they don't even talk about the internet. But this could change everything. It could change all of psychology, all of the stuff that we talk about. It could change everything. Your health. Is, is, does the internet uh, deplete your immune system? If Joe stays up for, what, two, three days straight, you know, playing whatever, Halo, or... No, you never do that. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, people do do that. And we're not really talking about the average person that, works, that plays video games. We're talking about the extremes. We're always talking about the extremes. We're talking about the people that are anorexic. That's a problem. We're never talking about the average person. Because that is normal, evidently. But it's, we're talking about the in individual that, that plays the game for three or four days, drinking Code Red and Monster. And, I, what, what's, what are they doing to themselves? Why is this different? And so it's, it's up to you guys to come up with the answer. It's up to Joe to come up with the answer because he plays video games the rest of you. If you don't play video games, you have no clue what I'm talking about. Anyway, psychoneuroimmunology. Is this going to change things? Uh, and it, of course it took the doctors forever to figure this stuff out. Uh, since the revelations of the rat studies, medical uh, breakthroughs uh, dealing with immune system stress and disease processes have increased rapidly. And the reason it has is because they started doing research. They started doing the research. And before that, they weren't doing the research. Before that, they, the immune system was a mystery to everybody. Oh, it worked somehow. We're not exactly sure. Uh, we needed a crisis. Uh, when World War II started, we were, most people were flying biplanes, a lot of people, some people were flying monoplanes. Uh, by the end of the war, we were flying jets. So it takes stress, it takes a stressful uh, situation to change things. Uh, we found out about the immune system because, uh, not only because of the rat studies, but in the 1980s, we had the, out, the HIV outbreak. And because of that, and because it affected the immune system, we needed to find out really, really, really fast what was going on with the immune system. So it took a crisis uh, to get to, uh, to accelerate the process of learning these things. Otherwise, who's going to pay for the research? Ronald Reagan wasn't going to pay for the research. He was trying to, he was trying to uh, cut welfare. He was trying to do all kinds of things. He was trying to balance the budget. That's, he was elected because he was going to balance the budget. We're not going to be in, do any deficit spending any, anymore, he said. And then, of course, we had the HIV crisis that started in the early 80s. He was elected in 1980. He was inaugurated in 1981. And it started about 1981, 1982. Did it have anything to do with Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency? Is that where HIV... No, it didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> it just so happened. But he ignored it. He ignored it until like 1985 because he didn't want to spend any money on it. Money is important. Break that down. Money is the most important thing in the whole wide world. Just ask Ronald Reagan. Oh, wait a minute. He's dead. Don't ask him. He's probably a ghost or something. Anyway, okay, so all of this stuff uh, took place because of a crisis. <laughs> Do I have bad breath or what? I've got six people back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay up against this wall. Okay, there we go. Ashley and Elaine already believe you. Now researchers know that short-term stressors can increase uh, natural immunity in a process called upregulation. Uh, we and we we actually have discovered that upregulation and downregulation is very common as far as neurons are concerned. Uh, they, they increase or decrease their receptor cells. Upregulation is where they increase the number of receptor cells, seeking uh, whatever the neurotransmitter is. So if I take a drug that increases my serotonin level, in order for my body to protect itself, it needs to downregulate the number of receptor cells 
for serotonin. Otherwise, I'll go crazy. And, and the body doesn't want to do that. It wants to make me normal. So it will down-regulate the number of receptor cells. It's, this does the same thing with the immune system. Down-regulation and up-regulation. When you're not sick, it up-regulates. <clears throat> because it up-regulates, it's looking for that disease. It's looking for that, uh, uh, it's looking to fill that receptor. If that uh, disease process uh, uh, takes place, then it down-regulates. So what do stressors do? Well, stressors cause it to down-regulate. So you're not as, uh, you're not really looking for the diseases anymore. If you're under stress, that's the, that's a process of, that the human body takes. Down-regulation and up-regulation. Uh, immunosuppression, and I talk about immunosuppression from time to time. Uh, when you're under stress, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the things that immunosuppress you. Um, disease process, of course, immunosuppresses you. Divorce uh, makes you immunosuppressive. In other words, when you, uh, if you never get sick and then all of a sudden you get a divorce, uh, then pro possibly uh, it will make you immunosuppressed and you'll catch a cold or you'll catch something else. Let me tell you a quick story. <clears throat> I think I've talked about this before. I've talked about my sister. She, she died of cancer in 2003. Uh, just before she got sick, uh, her husband, who she loved dearly, came to her, and I, I think I've told you guys this story. Uh, her husband came to her and said, uh, Honey, uh, why don't we live as sisters? He was transgender. He wanted to, he wanted to change his name. He wanted to change his his being to from male to female. Um, and if it hadn't been my sister, I wouldn't care. I, who cares? <laughs> you can call yourself whatever you want. Uh, but of course it was my sister. <laughs> and uh, this is right at the beginning of uh, the, the whole concept of transgenderism. Uh, we had uh, talked about transvestites before, but never transgenders. Uh, and so, uh, you know, my sister, who was madly in love with the guy, uh, got upset. She got really upset. She got upset to the point that uh, she developed a cardiomyopathy. Her the muscles, her uh, heart became weak. Uh, the muscle cells in her, in her heart became weak, and they thought that she needed uh, that she was having heart problems. Uh, so the doctors went in and, and uh, they checked her out, and they said, "No, I think I think you've got another problem." They found a mass on her abdomen. And they went in and they cut out the mass, but they didn't get all of it. They couldn't get all the, the cancer because the cancer had already metastasized. Uh, so we fought, she fought cancer for an extended length of time. Uh, for about five years, she fought cancer. And, but she finally died. Uh, but the whole reason she became immunosuppressed uh, and started having uh, heart problems was because of, uh, of the stress of her husband telling her that he would rather be a woman than a man. And that really, yeah, you can imagine that. Kind of bothers you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so she died She died of cancer. Uh, but she was immunosuppressed. And, uh, and I understood this. And, and uh, of course, he claimed that uh, he could do anything he wanted. And he should be allowed to do that. And we shouldn't be prejudiced against transgender people. I'm not transgender. I'm not prejudiced against transgender people. I don't like him, okay? <laughs> Except him is a her now. He, he used to be Bob, and now he's Vivian. So uh, I don't like her either. <laughs> Can I be Bobby? <laughs> you know, that, that's logical. But uh, if you've ever been around individuals that uh, change their gender, they, they, it, it's never a simple change like that. It's always they follow themselves as... Wonder Woman goddess of the West or something like that kind of thing. <clears throat> yeah, he went from Bob to, to Vivian, Robert to Vivian. And he's living as Vivian today, so. And I don't care about that part. It's my dead sister that I care about. I don't care about the transgenderism. But it, the, whole, the whole point is that uh, my sister became immunosuppressed because of the stress of having her husband tell her that he would rather be a female. Uh, so divorce, of course, they, and they never got divorced. Uh, one of the reasons they didn't get divorced is because she needed to use his uh, health insurance in order to get treatment. So she was working for the state of Indiana at the time. 
Immunosuppression has been seen after the death in a family, and this is one of the things that you have to think about. Uh, most uh, uh, tribal, uh, most native uh, indigenous uh, peoples, uh, most of them will not allow people to, to uh, grieve for uh, an extended length of time. They usually put a limit on it. Up north, uh, the limit is a year. And after a year, you have to they dance you back into the circle, and if you don't do that, then they, well, it happens. It always happens. Nobody ever not, doesn't do it. But sometimes, it, the, the idea is that if you, you're not danced back into the circle, then you have to leave the tribe. That's the idea. But of course, that never happens either. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know what it is here. What? You, how long are you allowed to breathe? Is there a limit? Yeah, about four days. Four days? You have to stop breathing? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. See, that's the You need to get back into the swing of things. Okay. We can say that. Uh, immunosuppression uh, was uh, observed in individuals who were un unemployed, as you can imagine, looking for a job, not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, immunosuppression was seen in individuals who were in military training, uh, not uh, in the military. The military is not that, that traumatic. It's not immunosuppressive, but uh, the training is. The training is, is extremely hard physically. It's also hard mentally. Uh, most training is, not the Air Force, of course. The Marines, of course, they try to, to kill you, but uh, if, you don't join, if you join the Air Force, you're okay, but if you join the Marines or the Army, they try to kill you in their Training, excuse me. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> military training is tough. I did that. I did that. Yeah, and I was in the Air Force, so maybe the Air Force is pretty tough. I didn't think it was tough. Of course, I was in pretty good physical condition at the time. Um, taking exams. Uh, if you if you always get sick around exam time, around finals time, it's because you're immunosuppressed. A lot of individuals will uh, be okay as, as long as the finals are taking place, but then they get a cold, they catch a cold, or they catch the flu, or for like a week afterwards, they start throwing up or blowing their nose or something. All these things happen. <clears throat> Immunosuppression causes a reduction in natural killer cells, the T cells, and the total lymphocytes in your body. Remember, lymphocytes are what fight off viral diseases. Uh, so it fights off rhinoviruses, it fights off herpes. Oh, you see this, you see this a lot. When somebody's immunosuppressed, they'll get a cold sore. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day that was developing a cold sore, and it was because they were having problems in one of their classes. And I told them, relax, don't worry about my class. Do it when you get done. You know, you're, you're stressing out about all this stuff. Well, let Christine stress you out. Don't let me stress you out. Just take it easy. My God, just get it done whenever, okay? That's what I told them. I don't know if their cold sore went away. I haven't talked to them since. In one study looking at people that had high stress levels and those with low stress levels, 47% of the high stress participants contracted a rhinovirus when it introduced, while only 27% of those with low stress contracted the virus uh, after it was introduced to them. Rhinovirus, of course, is a cold, is the common cold. And so some people catch it and some people don't. Uh, the next picture is a little upsetting. Uh, I have to warn you, uh, this child has chicken pox, okay? It's the chicken pox. It's nothing else. All right. Both adults and children suffer more diseases when under stress. Uh, the flu is more common uh, with individuals who are under stress. Herpes virus infections, and that's what a cold sore is. It's herpes. Uh, chicken pox, and of course, this child has chicken pox. Mononucleosis is more likely. Uh, at str uh, when you're under stress. And Epstein-Barr virus. Actually, Epstein-Barr virus, and, and it causes mononucleosis, uh, but it also causes a uh, waste, not a wasting disease, uh, but a disease that's very difficult to eradicate. Uh, okay, I told you the story about uh, mononucleosis hitting a fraternity at my college. It was right at the end of the semester. <laughs> and they all got sick. The kissing disease. Yeah, they all got the kissing disease. But they had a beer bash and somebody drank out of the, you know, drunk in the bar. They drank out of the spigot. That's what happened. 
And he had mononucleosis. He got it from some chick, obviously. <laughs> Did I say chick? I'm sorry. That I, I, okay. Some uh, female personnel. Okay. He had been kissing some female personnel, and she gave it to him. Stress uh, has also been linked to autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, coronary ar uh, artery disease with accelerated process progress. I'm sorry. Um, studies looking at the healing process uh, found that the more uh, stress someone was under, the slower the individual would heal. So if you want to heal slowly, who does? If you want to heal slowly, then, uh, then you will not uh, take care of your stress. In a study looking at people having hernia operations, those under high levels of stress healed slower uh, with more pain uh, because, of their, uh, because of their stress. So stress can, can affect you in a lot of different ways. It makes you more sensitive to pain, for one thing. It also makes you heal slower. A uh, direct effect hypothesis is that uh, immunosuppression is part of the body's natural response to stress. T cells and B cells have been have both have receptor sites for corticosteroids. One of the stress hormones, which when activated, produces immunosuppression, and this is a problem. So the more stress you're under, the more suppressed your T cells and B cells will be, and therefore you you will be less likely to be able to fight off diseases. Lymphocytes uh, have uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, receptor, receptor suppressing, receptors suppressing the immune response. Uh, so this is a problem. So the more uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine you've got in your system, uh, the more likely that your lymphocytes will be suppressed. Remember, lymphocytes fight off viral diseases. Uh, neutrophils fight off bacterial diseases. So if you have, a, if you have uh, lymphocytes that are not functioning properly because of the uh, stress that you're under, the epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, then you will have a problem. Potentially you'll have a problem with diseases. When children grow up in con a contentious home, it lowers their cortisol uh, awakening response. They are less likely to respond to dangerous stress, which is linked to negative uh, health consequences in adulthood, including early mortality. Early mortality, you're gonna die younger because of the contentious home that you, you lived in. One of the things we know from Vietnam is that the individuals that suffered PTSD more readily were the individuals who had already been through some kind of trauma in their life. If they were sexually abused or physically abused, uh, if they lived in a contentious home, these individuals suffered from PTSD more than anybody else. Uh, I have four brothers. We were all combat veterans uh, to, to an extent. Um, my brother that has PTSD is the brother that had rheumatic fever when he was in the second grade. The, the other three of us are okay. We don't have that problem. But he suffers from PTSD, and he's the one that had rheumatic fever in the second grade. He didn't, he didn't go to school the entire second grade. So the friends that he made when he was in the first grade, they were all gone by the time he was in the third grade. It wasn't the fact that they weren't there. It was the fact that they hadn't seen him in a year, and he wasn't their friend anymore. And it took him years to recover from that. <clears throat> then once he, of course, went into combat, now we, now we got a problem. Now we got a really serious problem. That and the fact that he did some god-awful things when he was in the military. He was a tunnel rat, and if you know what a tunnel rat is, in Vietnam, the Vietnamese would dig uh, tunnels, and uh, Vietnamese aren't very big people. They're skinny. They, you know, they top out at about 120 pounds, they're about five foot three. Little bitty skinny guys. Well, luckily, if you're not a very big person, then you fit in those tunnels, damn it. And so, <laughs> my poor brother, of course, is about my size. <laughs> So he's about five foot four, five foot five, and here he is skinny. He's weighs about 110 pounds, and he's the only one that could squeeze through those holes. What a great job that was! And of course, they'd send you into the hole with what with a with a pistol and a flashlight and a knife. Of course, he had a knife. That's a great job. So go in there and see if you can scare anything out. <laughs> yeah. Of course, they're all in there with their their uh, AK 47s but they, they don't want to shoot inside. They don't want to shoot inside the, 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 uh, uh, the, the tunnels or the caves because they'll get ricochets and they're afraid they'll hit each other. Anyway, it was kind of, he didn't mind shooting, shooting his 45. But, uh, well, anyway, it's another story.
So he's crawling along in there, and of course if he shines his light, guess what happens? They know he's there. So he's crawling along in the dark, listening, trying to feel people's heat, trying to smell their stink. And uh, what a horrible job. He survived, obviously survived. We talk about him all the time. Uh, indirect effect hypothesis contends that immunosuppression is an after effect of the stress response. Stress may encourage maladaptive behaviors that disrupt uh, immune uh, functioning. Uh, people under a lot of stress may smoke in order to dissipate their uh, dissipate their uh, stress. Uh, they may drink a lot of alcohol, which uh, is a toxin. This is now all of a sudden we've, we're, t we're taking in two substances that make it worse. How stupid are we? Well, we're pretty damn stupid because people tell us, well, in order to, if you're under a lot of stress, then smoke will, will release your stress, will relieve your stress. Uh, if you get drunk, you don't wor have to worry about it for, I don't know, two or three hours while you're still drunk. We can take drugs and maybe it'll last for, you know, five or six hours. This is great. But of course, this immunosuppresses you as well. Uh, you can't sleep. Um, poor, poor Sarah. If you talk to Sarah, sometimes she wakes up at three o'clock in the morning to do stuff, to get up and do stuff. That's fragmented sleep. That's not good for you. You got to sleep through the night. You need to sleep right straight through six, seven, eight hours, whatever. But poor Sarah, she wakes up at three o'clock in the morning. And usually it has something to do with me, so she'll email me at three o'clock in the morning. Of course, I only read my email once or twice a day. <laughs> You know, she, this is, this is how bad it is. She gets her email on her cell phone. How stupid is that? <laughs> so, you know, I'll email Sarah something stupid, and she'll email me immediately back and say, what the hell are you talking about? Of course, Sarah. I kind of feel sorry for her that she's so te technologically s structured that she, th these things harass her right away. And I don't get harassed. Sometimes I don't read my email until tomorrow afternoon, so I'm not, you know, I don't worry about this stuff. Of course I'm not immunosuppressed. I don't worry about this stuff at all. Uh, so fragmented sheep, sleep can bother you, not sheep, sleep. Okay, fragmented <laughs> sheep. <laughs> the head's over there, the leg. Not enough exercise, of course, can be a problem, and poor nutrition, of course, is a problem as well. Uh, of course, if you smoke and drink, it changes the way that you eat. It also changes the way that you, uh, whether you exercise or not. All of a sudden, you can't exercise anymore because you don't have the, the, the oxygen uh, for it. You can't, you can't run anymore. So all of a sudden, you can't uh, exercise. Smoking weakens the normal production of macrophages at wound sites and also reduces blood flow through uh, vasoconstriction, thus uh, slowing the, the healing process. Uh, this was, this was I, I keep telling you guys that my friend just died of a heart attack. Uh, what happened was he had a massive heart attack. Uh, he smoked almost all of his life. Uh, once he had the heart attack, he was dead. I mean, he was gone. Even though he lasted for four or five more days, they had to take him off life support in order for him to die. Uh, but what happened was, because he smoked so much, he's got all these problems. So he had bleeding in his kidneys, he had bleeding in his abdomen. He had all kinds of interesting problems. Once, he, once the, uh, the wound started, he couldn't heal them. And the, the reason was because he smoked. Of course, I, 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 he's been my friend for 40 years, and I've been telling him for 40 years to stop smoking, and that's the last thing he was going to do. Oh, he's going to live longer than me, he's going to dance on my grave. And now he doesn't get to do it. <laughs> I'm still alive. He's gone. Oh, Joe. Poor Joe. He's, I've, 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 I've insulted Joe for the last time. He's leaving. <laughs> Smokers are also more likely to develop infections after surgery because nicotine and other toxins in the cigarette smoke suppress both primary and secondary immune re responses by reducing the activities of white blood cells. This is a problem. This is a real serious problem, and it killed my friend. It killed him because once he started, once the wound started, he couldn't heal them anymore. It caused more trouble for him, and now he's dead. And of course, if I could have yelled at him, I did yell at him from time to time. If I could have yelled at him, I could have explained to him what was why he was dying. 
but of course he was in a coma. He's pretty much gone after his heart attack, even though he lasted for four days. And they kept talking about, oh, it's, we're waiting for his kidneys to uh, respond. We're waiting for his kidneys to dis respond. They put him on dialysis. Well, geez, his brain is pretty much veg vegetable matter at that point. But, I mean, once the wound started, once the toxins kicked in, uh, he, was, he was a goner. There was just no way we could save him. Acute stressors uh, last a half an hour or less and produce transient uh, immune changes. Most immune cells parameters will return to pre-stress uh, levels within an hour or so. Uh, so if, if you have a really heavy stress right now, uh, potentially you can recover from it in relatively quickly. It doesn't have to, to cause a lot of problems. Chronic stressors produce temporary changes in cellular immune response. Researchers looking at students anticipating upcoming exams noted a change in um, immune response. Uh, even kindergarten children, the first day of school, they noticed that they had a stress response uh, to the first day of school. Little guys that they are, five years old, whatever. Allostatic load is the cumulative long-term effects of the body's physiological response to stress. Allostatic uh, load can build up when stressors are unpredictable, uncontrollable, of long duration, or difficult to deal with. And of course, if you're in the military, then the difficult to deal with, you understand what that is. Heavy allostatic load can affect an individual with decreased immunity, elevated epinephrine levels, increased abdominal fat, decreased hippocampal size, decreased hippocampal functioning, overproduction of interleukin-6 and other uh, inflammatory cytokines. And this, of course, is what happened to my friend. Uh, this guy had been smoking all of his life, and because of that, once he had an uh, inflammatory process started, there was just no way they could stop it. And that's why his kidneys shut down. That's why he had problems in his digestive tract. Uh, that's why he had all of these problems. Once the heart attack started, there was no healing it. I had a heart attack in 2010, and the healing process started almost immediately. One, I don't smoke, uh, and I don't drink, but the second thing is that I exercise. So I had all of these positive things going for me. He had all these negative things. I don't have uh, the interleukin-6, I don't have the, the uh, cytokines that he had, and because of that, he's gone. That's why he died. One of the things we used to notice was, and my mother told me this when she was working in the emergency room back in the, uh, what year was this, 2018, back in the, the 1950s, she used to work in the, the emergency room. She'd come home and she'd say, a guy came in with a heart attack, it wasn't that bad, but he died anyway. And he, they, you know, it was like a cascade. Once the, the process started, there was just no way they could stop it. But uh, my heart attack started four days before I even went in to see the doctor. And I still, still didn't do any damage to me, as exciting as that is. What am I trying to tell you? Don't smoke, don't drink, and exercise. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. <clears throat> Allostatic changes are similar to the aging process, leading such, uh, some researchers to characterize high allostatic overload as a form of accelerated aging and is seen in those of lower socioeconomic status because they can't afford uh, healthy foods. Prisoners of war, of course, which is uh, a trauma that most of us can't even fathom. Uh, the reality is we can't fathom it. Of course, right now we have uh, John McCain, who's in his early, late 70s, early 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, John McCain is fi trying to fight off glass, uh, uh, geoblastoma. There's a geoblastoma in his... Uh, uh, in his brain. He's trying to fight it off, but of course the fact that he was a prisoner of war for seven years uh, may, may terminate it. It, it. That may be a factor. Uh, immigrant workers, of course, unemployed adults, hurricane and earthquake survivors, all of these individuals have heavy allostatic overloads. The immune suppression model states that stress suppresses the immune system, leaving the individual vulnerable to opportunistic infection and diseases. And of course, this is what we see with rhinovirus. We have rhinovirus, you've got all, we've all got rhinovirus in our noses right now, but none of us are getting sick. 
However, if one of us is going through any kind of excess stress, like uh, Christine is telling you that you have to have something done by, by 12 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and you haven't even started it yet, then potentially that will cause you to, that rhinovirus to be able to uh, take hold in your nose uh, because you're not going to be able to, uh, your immune system's not going to be able to fight it off, and you're going to have problems. Now, if you understand the immune process, you can think about these things. You can say to yourself, well, if I, if, I, if I allow myself to get too stressed out, I'm going to get sick. So if you start to get sick, you can think, you can think to yourself, you know, the reason I'm getting sick is because I'm immunosuppressed. God, what in the world is causing so much stress that I'm having this problem? And then you need to alleviate the stress. If you understand this process, otherwise you just let it happen, and of course you get whatever your problem is, rhinovirus or whatever. Uh, glucocorticoid receptors uh, resistance model states that chronic stress interferes with the body's ability to regulate the inflammatory uh, response. This can cause runaway inflation, inflammation that promotes the acceleration of inflammatory diseases such as Parkinson's disease. Now, why in the world are so many people that snorted cocaine back in the back in the day? Why in the world are they coming down with Parkinson's disease? It's an inflammatory process. They've uh, insulted their brains, and they have destroyed brain cells with the, with the cocaine. And now, they, now they're developing Parkinson's disease. Cardiovascular disease, of course. How many times can you stress out your heart before your heart uh, uh, becomes weaker? Osteoporosis, probably not in this population. Osteoporosis is very common among people uh, who are very pale. Uh, so the paler you are, uh, the more likely you will de develop osteoporosis. In other words, it's a disease of uh, Caucasian females. It's especially a disease of Caucasian females who have red hair, because they have very few, uh, they have very little melanin in their skin. Uh, so the paler you are, the blondes, the uh, redheads, uh, those are the ones, that, and skinny. They have to be uh, skinniness has something to do with it as well. Uh, those are the ones that develop osteoporosis. Arthritis, type 2 diabetes, very prevalent in this population. Alzheimer's disease and periodontal diseases. So you start having gum diseases. Uh, in the transactional model, stress is triggered when stressors exceed the personal and social resources the individual uses to cope. So if you've got a friend that you can call on the phone and they make you feel better, there you go. You've, taken, you've, you've coped with your problem. Uh, and sometimes all it takes is telling somebody about the problem that you have. Uh, if you work someplace, it's always nice to have somebody that you can talk to. Be careful. Sometimes that person is not a, a friend. <laughs> sometimes they're looking for gossip <laughs> or dirt. Uh, thus, the experience of stress depends on, uh, as much on how an event is appraised as it does on the event itself. Uh, so the reality is, it's, uh, if, if I have to work uh, late, uh, and I have to work late on the 21st, I have to film that guy coming in for Sarah. You know, I won't get to go home. It's like Wednesday night. So I'll be here until 4.20. Then I, then I have to, I have to load the, the camera back up. I have to unload and, and load the camera back up, and then go down and, and film whatever his name is. I can't remember who it is. Yeah. Is this tomorrow? I'm sorry? That, the speaker tomorrow? Yeah, the speaker. It's going to be here. Is it tomorrow? Tomorrow is that speaker? No, well, it's the 21st. Yeah. And there's one on the 5th. Um, Calvin White. Is Calvin White going to be here tomorrow night? No, I think that's going to be During the day? I don't think I have to film it. She didn't say anything. Here we go. So what is she going to have to eat? What's Sarah going to have to eat? Yeah. I explained to her I can't eat mutton, but she keeps ordering mutton. Because you pick on her a lot. I need to be nicer to Sarah. Okay, I need to be nicer to Sarah. I say nice things about Sarah. I explain to you guys why she's under stress. The one tomorrow is Jack Jackson. Oh yeah, I'm Jack. Is that tomorrow night? So it's tomorrow 10.30 to 
Okay, I'm fine. Here are statistics, you get extra credit. Oh. Get your extra, extra credit, why not? Okay. I can't eat mutton. Because it smells like wine. You don't want to know. <laughs> you really don't want to know. <laughs> uh, why not? <laughs> why, why don't you want to know? Maybe you'll stop eating it. I don't want you to stop eating it. I don't want to change your, your eating patterns. I'm sure it's, it's, it looks like really healthy meat, doesn't it? I mean, it's red, right? When I was in the service, one of my jobs, one of my jobs was body repairing. So if there was an airplane crash, I had to recover the body. A lot of times, when there's an airplane crash, there's fuel. They call it JP4, and it burns really, really well. So sometimes they would crash, and then they would burn. They would crash and burn. And I had to recover the body. I had to put them in the body bag. Sometimes I had to do autopsies, which is not a lot of fun. So I got to dig around and, and so all that odors coming out. Okay, all the odors coming out. Most of it smells like cream. I know it's not seasoning. That's good. <clears throat> anyway, so that was one of my jobs, you know. It didn't bother me at the time. And I didn't even think about it. You know, what does this stuff smell like? I didn't even think about it. Your dad has a better answer. Oh, your dad has the same problem? No, no. He, he just, like, I don't know. But my uncle's sister, no, my uncle's wife's sister, she now has a problem with the children. She can't hear the sound of the cutting and all that. I, I, I didn't think Now she doesn't she does eat my own. <laughs> my, mine has a mother. <laughs> Okay, so uh, here I am, uh, and everything's fine, you know, I've been, I've recovered all these bodies, and there's no problem, I've got no problem at all, uh, and uh, they, then they had a beef strike in, in all over the United States, uh, so everybody's eating chicken, and they're eating, you know, a lot of pork, uh, so I go to the commissary one time, the only meat they had was mutton, and I didn't think anything about it, it's, you know, it's mutton, who, who cares? It's red, right? Maybe I can get the kids to eat. Uh, you know, so I took it home and I cooked it. Uh, and while it was cooking, I got the weirdest vibe. I mean, it was really, yeah, it was really kind of weird, really kind of strange. I couldn't, and I couldn't figure it out. What the hell's going on? This doesn't make any sense. And so I, you know, I sat down. I wasn't feeling very good. I was feeling kind of sick in my stomach. Not that that had anything to do with it, it was probably from cooking the milk. But I sat down to eat, and of course the kids wouldn't eat it because it didn't taste like beef, or it didn't taste like a pork chop, didn't taste like chicken. Uh, so, I, I, so I started eating it, and at that point I realized what was going on. It tastes like human flesh smells in the flesh. That's the way it tasted. And then I had to put it in my mouth before I realized what was going on. At that point. I spit it out. I mean, truly, I spit it out. <clears throat> so, it has a sweet flavor, a sweet odor, doesn't it? Humans have the same. Or mutton. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, <laughs> and you know, the amazing thing is, I can't imagine, and there, there are places that that's all they eat, you know, like Greece, that's, you know, they, they eat mutton, like everything is mutton. I can't imagine, have they never? They've never experienced the same things about it. Anyway, I can't can't even be around it when it's cooking anymore. So, because of the odor. And there's other vet, vets on the on the uh, reservation that have the same problem that I have. You know, so you know, it all depends on what what you, what you experienced. I experienced burned human flesh a lot. I didn't eat it, of course, but I smelled it, and it got on my palate. It, I mean, it gets on your palate. There's nothing you can do. Anyway, that's the reason I can't do that. Okay? And there's, there are others of us out, out there. I'm not the only one. Uh, but the reality is that uh, potentially, even if you're a veteran and a combat veteran, you were never around you burn human flesh. I mean, that's a possibility. 
if you just shoot people, blood doesn't smell like that. Or whatever. But if you cook them. <laughs> yeah, they were airplane crashes, so that was the reason I had to recover so many of them. We didn't really have that many airplane crashes, but uh, it only takes one or two before you got a problem. It was a pilot training base, so uh, when, when we recovered bodies, we didn't recover one. We always had to recover two. So. Anyway, that's the reason why. Sorry. So I don't want to, I want to change your eating habits at all. I, mutton's pretty, pretty healthy food, but uh, I can't eat it. I'm sorry. And I can't be around it when it's cooking. So, Eat, no matter what you put on it, I can still smell it. It's pretty bad. <clears throat> anyway, primary appraisal is the initial determination of an event's uh, meaning. Uh, secondary appraisal occurs to evaluate if one has the ability to meet the demands of a challenging event. Cognitive reappraisal is the process by which events are constantly reevaluated. Uh, okay, so uh, anytime some kind of a crisis occurs, uh, like this is a flood, uh, they would uh, evaluate as to how much trauma that's going to cause. That's the primary appraisal. The secondary appraisal is uh, seeing if, like, like this, this lady, can she handle it? Is she tough enough to handle this situation? And of course, that's the secondary appraisal. And then they'll look back uh, to determine what, uh, what, whether people were able to handle it or not. That's what happened with Katrina, and that's one of the reasons why there was such a, a backlash for Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, uh, when so many people died in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, and of course, most of the people that died were the poor, poorer people who couldn't get out. Uh, before the uh, hurricane hit, and those were the ones that died, and most of them were African American, and because of that, of course, it seemed like the president at the time, George W. Bush, uh, didn't do enough to try to help these people, and of course, he wasn't there for four or five days. He went down to the Gulf, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, where all the rich white people are, uh, but he didn't visit uh, New Orleans, and there were all kinds of horrible things that happened in New Orleans at the time. <clears throat> Situations or events are not inherently stressful or unstressful, but must be interpreted by the individual. So something that is stressful for you may not be stressful for me, uh, or vice versa. Uh, if you've ever been in an, an emergency situation, if you've ever worked in the emergency room, then you know what I'm talking about. Some people can handle it and some people can't. Uh, mostly it has to do with whether you can uh, deal with something without thinking about it. Uh, normally you just have to react rather than, than get emotional about it. If you, if you get emotional about anything, it's all over with. You might as well go home because you're not going to be doing anybody any, any good at all. So you have to, you have to react to things uh, rather than uh, uh, get emotional or, or have an emotional reaction to things. Cognitive appraisals are extremely susceptible to changes in mood, health, motivation, and very often change with the circumstances. Uh, the body's stress response is nearly the same whether a situation is actually experienced or merely imagined. Thus, stress can be induced by the uh, remembering an incident or a possible incident. And this is, has, this is a really uh, interesting problem because uh, we had people coming back from Vietnam and these guys were in Saigon the whole time. Well, and, and they suffered from PTSD. And everybody's going, oh my God, I was in combat and you know, I saw all this stuff and, uh, and, and, and I didn't suffer from PTSD. And here you were in Saigon and, and uh, you suffered from PTSD. Well, the reality is that it's not what happens to you, it's what you, you think might, might happen to you. And that's what was going on in Saigon. There, was, there were a lot of bombings. Uh, there were a lot of assassinations taking place in, in, uh, in Saigon. Uh, if you were in combat, you had, and, and of course, these guys are wandering around without weapons. Uh, so yeah, sure, and they were in a building that everybody knew was uh, the American building, so it it's, can potentially be targeted by the Viet Cong. Uh, after 1968, 1968 is, at, is, is when the Tet Offensive occurred, uh, and during the Tet Offensive, all these Viet Cong infiltrated uh, Saigon and Da Nang and, and Hue uh, and, and attacked uh, American-held uh, areas. And so here's these individuals that have never, or they 
person to handle their weapon in basic training. But here they hadn't really been in combat, and all of a sudden they were being thrown out to the wall and being forced to defend, defend the, uh, uh, their compound. Uh, so it really didn't matter whether you were in combat or not. Everybody was in combat during the Tet Offensive in 1968. So what does that mean in 1969? Are, are, am I safe? In Saigon, and was I safe in 1971 in Tansanu, at Tansanu? Because Tansanu was attacked in 1968 as well. So, is there a possibil probability, possibility that I'm going to be attacked as well? Here I am, and, and it looks like I'm behind the lines, I don't have to worry about anything. And of course, they did have something to worry about. Because there's always a possibility. This is, this is a war zone. So if, even if you're in the green zone in, uh, in Baghdad, there's always a possibility that somebody, there's rocket, rocket attacks and mortar attacks uh, from time to time. There's always a possibility that you're going to get injured. So these individuals suffered just as much as the people out on the, uh, on the line. As a matter of fact, they may have suffered more because the people out on the line were carrying weapons. And they, weren't, they were, had pins and pencils and, and uh, computers. To, to protect themselves with. Try to protect yourself with that. <laughs> Somebody shoots an AK-47 at you, pull that thing up and see if it balances up. When my brother went to, to, uh, to Afghanistan, uh, my dad bought him a, a new computer. This is back in 2005. Uh, so the computers were, I know, these, these are all really cool computers, but the computer my brother had actually would deflect around. It was armor plate, <laughs> and that's what my dad bought for him. He bought him a Kev Kevlar covered uh, <laughs> computer. It was really kind of interesting because the damn thing weighed about uh, five pounds. But uh, that's what my brother carried all over. And he put it in his, uh, he put it against, he'd use it for, for armor, you know. He put it in his, ch in his chest, which was kind of interesting. I mean, it had two, two uh, layers of Kevlar. There was, uh, if you closed it up, there was the lever, the, 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 the uh, Kevlar on the bottom, the Kevlar on the top. So he had two levels of, of course it would have busted his computer, maybe. Anyway, so he would carry it around in, his, in the front of it. And he would pretend that he was using it as a uh, computer, you know. He was writing notes while he was, you know, whatever. He was out someplace. My dad, my dad fought World War II and they didn't have any armor plating. Uh, the rest of us, all of his kids fought in uh, Vietnam and we had uh, steel. And then of course the uh, armor that they had uh, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq was a lot lighter than, than what we had. And it covered more of the body. Uh, what are we talking about? Uh, okay, so it really doesn't matter whether you suffer the trauma, it's thinking about the trauma that can cause a problem. One of the things we discovered after 9-11 was that not only were the people in New York City and the people in Washington, D.C. stressed out because of the uh, terrorist attacks. But the people in Chicago were stressed out. The people in Montana, as odd as that seems, were stressed out as well. The kids who just saw the, the, the stuff on television, they were stressed out. And it's, it's, it's because um, they didn't suffer the trauma, but they suffered the trauma in their minds. And because of that, of course, of course it's just as bad. We know that it's just as bad. Diathesis uh, stress, uh, con uh, constitutional predisposition uh, model uh, purports that an individual's susceptibility to stress and illness is determined by two interacting factors. Uh, predisposing factors in the person that uh, establishes a person's vulnerability. This has to do with your genes. It also has to do with how people tell you that this is supposed to, how you're supposed to react. So it's your acquired behavior. <clears throat> it has to do with whether your parents tell you to be afraid of snakes or not, or whether your parents tell you to be afraid of black males because they, they, they are rapists. If they tell you these things, that if you see a black male in Gallup, then potentially you're going to get scared. And that is, it's an acquired behavioral response because they have told you that. I have a brother that is afraid of snakes. I have one brother out of, out of three brothers, or well, out of four of us. I'm not afraid of snakes. My other two brothers aren't afraid of snakes, but I have a brother that's definitely afraid of garter snakes. We don't even have any poisonous snakes in Indiana. 
okay? And he's scared of snakes. He's never seen a, a poisonous snake. I killed, I don't know, five rattlesnakes when I was up in Montana. It's not easy to kill a rattlesnake. I mean, I, you need something long for one thing. So you don't want to grab them and pull their heads off. That doesn't work. They can bite you for like two hours after you after you cut their heads off. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a reflex action. So if you get close enough to this thing, he can bury his fangs in, into you, even though his head's not connected to his body. It's just a reflexive uh, reaction. So if you get too close to the fangs, if you get too close to the severed head, it's going to bite you. So it can be broken. Yeah. He's still got the venom. It's still in there. I mean, I didn't milk the venom out of his. Why am I talking about this? I can't remember. <laughs> I gotta remember. Acquired, okay, acquired behavior. So somebody told him to be afraid of snakes. Somebody told my oldest brother to be afraid of snakes, and that's why he's afraid of snakes. Precipitating factors from the environment, uh, traumatic experiences that you've had. Uh, so if something has happened to you, uh, potentially, if you're in a, a vehicle that ha was in an automobile accident, you may be afraid to ride in a, in a car. Uh, some individuals may be more reactive to the environmental, our environmental factors than others. Uh, this seems to be a point of fact. <clears throat> uh, Post-traumatic stress uh, disorder is a psychological disorder triggered by exposure to an extreme traumatic stressor. Uh, PTSD is associated with combat and catastrophic environmental events such as rape or abuse. Uh, PTSD was recognized as an independent disorder during the Vietnam War. Now, I talk about money all the time and I apologize for that, but the reality is that we knew that the PTSD was here. We knew that our combat veterans were suffering from PTSD, but they didn't recognize it until the 1980s. Now all these guys came back from Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. So why in the world didn't the VA recognize it in the 60s and 70s? They saw it, they knew it was happening, they knew that these guys had a problem. What did they do about it? What did they do about it? <laughs> of course they did, because it would have cost them money to treat it. So a lot of these individuals came back, they're suffering from PTSD, they couldn't get a good diagnosis from the, the VA, and the reason is because they'd have to pay them disability. So here these guys had, uh, had uh, PTSD and they had it for an extended length of time and it took them decades to get any disability money. By that time they were dying of cancer, or they were dying of some part of age of orange, they were dying of something else, so the, the government didn't have to pay for it. Same thing happened after the first Iraq war. These guys came back with something. And we weren't exactly, it was, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Iraq Force Syndrome or something. Uh, lethargy, they had lethargy. A lot of different interesting problems that they had. Well, it took the government uh, like 10 years before they admitted that that was a possibility. <clears throat> because they didn't want to spend the money. Uh, the psychological symptoms include haunting memories and nightmares, mental distress, and flashbacks. I told you about my brother. Uh, he started living with my parents. Uh, he built uh, rifle pits all around the property, just in case that, that he came under attack. Uh, he had clear fields of fire. He would he would cut down all the trees in front, in front of his rifle pits. He would uh, camouflage them. He did a really good job. I fell into one time. I'm on sport in the wood. Nice snot. Uh, I got into trouble with him one time. I went home and I was, uh, we have a curve in, our, in the creek on our property and I was, it, it, it's washing away the bank. So I started putting rocks and started gathering rocks and putting them against the bank so it wouldn't wash away. That makes sense, doesn't it? Well, unfortunately, I used some of the rocks from one of his rifle pits that I didn't even, I didn't even know he had them. At that point, he explained to me what was going on and he showed me all the fields of fire. And I'm going, this is whack wacky. This is nuts. You're in the middle of Indiana. <laughs> Your fields of fire are covering our field, okay? This is where we plant our wheat, and this is where we plant our, 
our soybeans, and here he's got clear fields of fire for the entire field. And I'll tell you what, if we had been invaded by I don't know who, aliens, Viet Cong, terrorists, I don't know what he was, what he was fighting against, or what he was uh, defending his, uh, uh, his property for, but if they had walked in that field, they would have been dead men. He could have gotten them all. And he only had a semi-automatic rifle. Unfortunately, he, he bought himself a, a rifle. He had a uh, World War II uh, uh, M1 carbine. And that thing will shoot, I don't know, the, the uh, clip is, I don't know, 15 shots or something. And you can pop those things off. He could have killed 15 people with that, with that rifle. We had hunters that would come on our property. We don't allow hunting on our property. And they would come and they would, you know, walk around. Of course, they're look. They they've got those. Uh, uh, they, they've got uh, deer rifles. They're carrying deer rifles. And of course, my brother's telling them to leave, and they're not leaving. And he's got that that uh, carbine strapped to his back. Nobody got killed. Don't worry about it. Nobody died. Yeah, he was suffering from PTSD, and it, and it got kind of ugly a couple times, <clears throat> potentially. Uh, physiological symptoms of PTSD include increased hormone levels uh, uh, over time of uh, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, testosterone, and thyroxine. Now, why testosterone? The others are stress hormones, but why testosterone? Why would that increase over time? What does testosterone do? We're not talking about your sex drive, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with your sex drive in this case. So what would, what would testo why would your testosterone go up? What does testosterone do, have to do with any of this stuff? Increase the adrenaline. adrenaline. <coughs> is it like a protective, protective factor? Or? Well, it does increase something. Uh, the adrenaline's already increased. Yeah, that's epinephrine. It's already increased. Mm -hmm. okay. So what, why, why would your testosterone go up? Energy? I'm sorry? Energy? Um, energy, we can call it energy if you want. Is it just like biologically, like you're trying to protect yourself? <coughs> or like you're trying to protect whatever? Does it kill off bacteria? Testosterone causes aggression. Mm -hmm. One of the problems we, I had, we had with my brother he doesn't drink, but he'd go into bars and he'd get himself into a fight. And he'd take on everybody. And he'd, he'd fight to win. He didn't fight. He didn't fight to, to, to fight. He fought to win. And he'd kick guys in the nuts. I mean, he'd do anything to win. It. And he would. He'd clear out the bar. It didn't matter how big they are. They're, my brother's smaller than I am. Remember, he was a total rat little bitty guy and when he picks on somebody they think that they're going to win but he didn't care he, he hit him someplace that they didn't think that they were going to be hit because they thought that they were fighting I don't know. They, thought that they were boxing they weren't boxing he was fighting to, to win and it's because he, he he became aggressive he became overly aggressive and it had to do with his testosterone level attempts at coping with ptsd include frequent occurrence uh, or Comorbidity of substance abuse problems. And of course, he didn't have that problem. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke. Uh, depression, which he did have. Anxiety disorder, which he did have. Obviously, he was paranoid. He was he was uh, uh, defending our property. He was building rifle pits in order to defend our property. Well, that sounds like paranoia to me. It scared the crap out of me. I was afraid to take my kids over to my parents' house. I was afraid my brother would go berserk at some point. <clears throat> uh, one time, do I have time to tell the story? Uh, yeah. Uh, one time I went home, it was summertime. It was like three years after he came out, he uh, came back from Vietnam. And these kids were driving past and uh, they, they did a Chinese fire drill. Do you know what a Chinese fire drill is? Mm -hmm. They all got out of the car and they all switched places. Yeah, that's stupid. Uh, and these were a bunch of drunk drunk punk kids, and uh, they're all male. Uh, there were four of them in the car, and when they got out, they kicked all these beer cans out. So here they are right in front of our property, and uh, they're all 
running around the park, and he heard the, the, the cans. He heard the cans come out of the park. And so he went, went down there with an axe. He was cutting something with the axe. And he took his axe with him, and he went down there, and he told him, pick up all those cans and put them back in the park. Of course, these kids are kind of drunk, and they're all teenagers, and they're all you know, talking about having fun. That he, could go, he could go fun himself, you know, that kind of thing, as, as interesting as that is. And uh, my brother's holding this axe, and he's not smiling, not at all. And I was down, I, I had, uh, when I heard the cans drop, and I saw Russell heading down there, I went down to make sure nothing happened. And I, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to smooth things over, and here's my brother standing over the axe, and he's not that far away from these guys. And these guys are, you know, following him. Using F words on the phone. Okay. And he, yeah, I can see him getting madder and madder and madder, and they're not picking up the cans, and they're not picking up the cans. And I told him, look, guys, why don't you just pick up the cans, you know, go someplace, I don't care what, where you go or what you do, just, you know, you need to get out of here and you need to pick up your cans, because something might happen. And they looked in his eyes, and at that point, they picked up the cans and left. Because <laughs> he had death in his, way, in his eyes. He did, and that's one of the reasons I went down there. Anyway, okay, so what are we talking about? Why did I do, what are they talking about? Testosterone. <laughs> testosterone. Anxiety <laughs> disorder. Anxiety disorder. Okay, testosterone. People who feel a lack of social support, women who experience harassment or sexual assault, and those with lower intelligence may especially uh, be susceptible to uh, PTSD. Uh, something interesting has happened. Uh, Kate Upton has come out against uh, one, the uh, CEO of, of Guess for, uh, for, for molesting her. Uh, evidently, he, uh, he uh, manipulated her breasts to find out if they were real. Now, this is when she was 18 years old. Uh, we're getting a lot of stories coming out of Hollywood, coming out of uh, the modeling uh, industry uh, about women who have been, have been uh, sexually assaulted. Uh, in one form or another, or have been threatened with sexual assault. Uh, and this is, really, this is really necessary, because women sometimes feel like they don't have a, don't have a choice. They, have to, allow them, they have, have to allow this stuff to happen. And of course, uh, this is, now we're finding out that, uh, that all these things have happened. Uh, so it's a good thing. This Me Too up, uh, thing is, is, is really a good, is really something good that's happening in the United States. And, and we need to, uh, to be aware that uh, they're very brave women for coming forward because they can lo lose their livelihood. You know, Kate Upton, she's talking about modeling. She's a multi-millionaire at this point, but, you know, potentially she could lose her livelihood. 